reopen the frame in Frame Generator and see how maybe a three and a half inch frame is going to stand up with the exact same geometry. I'm sure it's a lot cheaper to use three and a half inch if you can. Um, it's about twice the cost for five inch versus wow. three inch. Right. So we're back in Inventor. We've made a little bit of a change with Frame Generator's ability to go in there, select my elements, and just switch them to three and a half by three and a half. And we'll just do a quarter inch wall thickness now. See how a little bit of a material change might save a lot in cost, but we've got to be able to evaluate that performance and see if it can hold up to meet our factor safety criteria. Exactly. Now let's take a look at the simulation results from this new geometry. We get back into simulation and we're just kind of going to fast forward again to the results here. And we take a look at our factor of safety, right? So you see we have, again, this is the same plot, right? From three to five. The majority of the frame's still blue but we have a couple areas where we have some red, right? So we have factor safety lower than three. Now if we take a look, you know, right here where this angled piece meets up with that base structure, we have kind of a decent area that could be problematic to us. Why don't we go ahead and key in on that area for our next design change? And that's the really the cool thing to me being a designer and using simulation is that I may have three or four different ideas from my colleagues or in my own mind that I have, and being able to evaluate them and see which one works best, that to me is the most benefit that I'm ever going to see from simulation, besides making all these pretty pictures. Exactly. So what I'm going to do for this design change is actually throw in some vertical supports. You know, that should definitely alleviate the bending there uh, and, and put more of it into compression in those vertical posts. Hit my mesh button. Go over to Simulation, Generate Mesh, Solve It. Let's take a look at the results from this one. It's pretty much all blue. You notice there's tiny little red specks around the corners, but again, that's where we've assumed that there's no weld material. If we went ahead and added in weld material, we'd be able to fully uh, evaluate that and see if it's going to be safe. But if we look, there is really one hot spot that we haven't talked about yet, and that is right where the gusset on the bottom meets up with the tube. Let's go ahead and zoom up on this thing and see exactly what's going on. And again, first of all, what we have to do whenever we see a hot spot is turn off the smoothing. Exactly. You know, smoothing to me assumes that what you're smoothing is good stuff underneath. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. You're making a dip at a party, you're making a guacamole, you know, if you have a bad tomato in there, it's going to ruin the whole dip, but the whole thing smooths it out. Now, that's a good analogy, but <laughs> I, I, I find it so important to look at the elemental values. And what we see when we zoom up on this is that it indeed is just one single row of elements that are red and right next door are blue. Okay, that's going right. to tell you something right there. Oh, sure. You want to have a constant change. You want to have a smooth mosaic of color. Now, if we zoom in further, what you'll see is that if we look and rotate this around, What's actually happening is when this thing auto meshed, mm -hmm. it tied the round piece of the tube to the gusset with only one node. Right. We talked about how those edges, you know, this was going to be kind of a conservative view, right? Mm -hmm. Because those rounded off portions were not going to be in contact, so they wouldn't bond together. Now, what you see it's done here is it's bridged that gap automatically, but only in one point, right? So we're going to have obviously a really high stress concentration there if it's supporting, you know, all the load that would be mm -hmm. transferring through this whole side just on a single point. Single node, yeah. And again, imagine this whole thing is uh, the whole construct of elements and nodes of just transferring force. And, you know, this is, again, another reason why we have to get up and intimate with our stress concentrations because this thing is calling out max stress uh, and pointing right to this location and, and calling out a pretty big number of 300,000 PSI. So yeah. does that mean my whole design is, is, is crap because we're 10 times you know, over where we want to be? No. no way. We just got to basically qualify all of our hotspots. Mm -hmm. And so again, looking at the elemental, and then we see, oh, okay, that mesh is bad. Now, is there anything we can do about this? I mean, at this point, we've used the auto mesher, right? Yes. It, which is a good way to get an overall mesh right. on your geometry. Obviously, I don't even know how though. I would do it without no, that. But it's not going to be perfect. In this case, it tried, it thought we wanted to bond, and it jumped right. the gap a little bit too much. Now, is there anything we can do to fix it once it's got to this point? Well, we're going to have to rerun it because we have to go back and modify the mesh so the forces don't transfer through there. And a couple things we want to do. Um, I can think of three or four workarounds, first of which would be go back into Inventor and actually throw in 
uh, weld geometry, fill sure. it and groove weld. Uh, now that's kind of a lot of work. And right. my instinct is telling me that if I did have the weld in there, it'd be just fine. Sure. So we can simulate the weld, we can idealize the weld using what we call a contact element set. So if I go up to my geometry menu, I can do an add contact elements. And basically this is going to allow me to link together two different faces. And not really faces, but the nodes. Exactly. It's any series of points can be connected to any other series of points. So in this case, we're going to choose a surface, and then we're going to choose another surface, right? So if you notice here, we choose basically the bottom surface of the one tube and then the bend surface of the other tube. We don't want this entire surface connected to the other entire surface, but if we put in uh, a length constraint, right? So you have minimum and maximum length constraints you can use. If we put in a maximum length constraint that's a little bit larger than this gap size, mm -hmm. it's only going to connect an area right around there, which is actually going to be pretty representative of our weld. You see the lines here. And these lines, they're elements. They're line elements. But what type of element do we want to make them? So what I can do here is choose a beam, a truss, a rigid element. And we'll talk later in episodes where we'd use each one of those. But for this one, I'm just going to call it a, a, a truss element and give it a, a representational diameter. And really what we're doing again is just idealizing the fact that there's a bunch of material that's going to fill this gap. Right. And when we take a look at the results after running it, it's pretty clear that that did the trick and everything is, is blue 20,000 uh, PSI stress or so. Right. So that again, was, that was it, what was it before 200,000, 300,000? 300, right. So you can see exactly how troublesome one bad mesh point can be. So with these results, we can say that our design looks pretty darn good. It meets our factor safety criteria, meets our displacement criteria, and barring maybe some further analysis of the actual mounting plates on the floor, this thing's good to go. Exactly. So we got a lot done today because oh. we started with that blank slate, right? We had a couple ideas ranging from big block of steel to Which a well. Which I liked. I, you know what? That would have a factor of safety well above three. And, and that's the problem is that, you know, even just doing structural steel frames, we did a pretty big range from over-designed with the 5-inch tube sure. to a little bit under-designed with the 3.5-inch tube and not enough geometry. You know, in the end, we were able to save about $1,000 moving from the 5-inch just to moving to a 3.5-inch tube. Now, that's per frame, too. Per frame. Right? So if we're designing one of these, hey, we still saved 1000 bucks. But Absolutely. If, if we're going to make 10 of this same frame, yeah, that can be pretty significant already. Absolutely. And, and that's the big thing. With, when you're designing anything, so much of the cost is in the front end of the design. When we're making decisions like what type of structural steel do we need to purchase, sure. that's where all the cost lies. And of course, the longer run of the product, the more we need to be simulating early and often. More information is better than less information. And that's really what simulation is all about. Putting this tool in my hands in the beginning so I can pick better alternatives. Yeah. In fact, we can actually automate some iteration of steel cross sections using optimization. That sounds like a future episode. Oh, you bet it is. Awesome, because if we can make the computer do this work, heck, I'm out of here for the day. I don't know about that. We'll <laughs> see. So this is good. We saw today how we can show others our ideas, how we can simulate them, make sure that we're designing safe products, meeting criteria, but also saving money. Exactly. Now, we've only covered really one topic today, right? Statics. This Linear was statics. Structural static testing. Right. And if we take a look at the robots moving, is this static? Are they just dumb weights sitting on the frame? Not really. So next time what we're going to look at is dynamic loading and how that differs from static and what we can expect in terms of amplification of the results and how that affects our decision to go with this current design. Yeah. Not to mention, is this design correct? Absolutely. It, it is for statics, but who knows? So until then, simulate early, simulate often. I'm Brian. I'm Dave May. See you guys later.